So Michelle Wool, 146 year uh, story in the making, five generations of traders, we evolved into a manufacturing company. We currently process about 8% of the Australian wool clip and we turn over a lot of money to do it, sometimes making it, sometimes not, but uh, that's uh, commerce. Our main focus is carbonising. Now carbonising is the, um, the process of removing vegetable matter from wool using acid and also scouring at the same time. We've tried a lot of things in our journey over 146 years. Some have worked and some have not. Um, and I've really given away the punchline as to uh, you know, why we're still here. But you'll see the theme of constant innovation right through uh, my talk today. But first, a quick summary of 146 years. So we began in 1870, mid-north of South Australia, 100 k's north of Adelaide. Uh, we traded raw wool. The original founder was paid for his uh, labours of fixing pots and pans in wool, so he had to do something with it. He sent it by bullock train to Adelaide, which was then sent to the UK for sale, and he got paid six months later. Um, to add value or reduce cost, he decided to build a scour in the Wakefield River, so to remove the dirt, so there was less to ship to the UK, which he then shipped off to the UK, and he got paid for it six months later. And in the 1900s, uh, the family decided to move to Adelaide, and of course they set up their scour again, this time in the Torrens River in central uh, Adelaide, and did the same thing. Uh, they bought wool in this case rather than getting paid for their labours, and they scoured it, sent it to the UK, got paid six months later. Moving on to the second generation of the family, there were four brothers involved. Um, the war years prompted more experimentation. Uh, we stepped into combing wool, um, in the UK and India, we added more value by taking scoundrel to the next step. Um, we added value to it and it was now ready for spinning. Now this brought a whole new raft of challenges for us. We had to find new customers, new markets, as we're now selling a technical manufactured product. Um, so several of the family went off to Europe to work out how to do that. Um, China also entered our world in, in the mid 40s. Um, and we sent one of our family there to find out how it worked. And we set up an office in 1948 um, to service our major communist buyers, and we've been there ever, ever since. Moving on to third and fourth generation uh, and more experimentation, um, and even the fifth generation in this period of time up to 1999, there are more resources around in terms of family members. In fact, there are almost too many of us. Um, that meant that we had more resources to, to enable experimentation, so we did. We added uh, more trials, more machinery, um, and we threw into the, into the mix of uh, focus on marketing. We explored markets that were difficult at the time. Uh, they are like Middle East, India, Russia, China, USA, Korea, South America, New Zealand and Canada, which is basically the world. Uh, China was still in its infancy, but uh, the rest of the world was still going great guns. So making a product was difficult, but selling it was actually the key for us. Now we added new combing machinery in Adelaide. Um, we added the latest shrink proofing processes, which we still use today. We even tried a non-water solvent scouring methodology, but that was way too dangerous because it was basically a bomb sitting there to go off, so we gave that one the miss. It's been tried since, and it's also uh, the same fate resulted. We were knitters and dyers for 15 years. We dabbled in mixing wool and synthetics. We even became bankers and a founding member of the Sydney Futures Exchange. We've tried a lot. We outgrew our factory in the 70s um, and decided to build a new state-of-the-art one, which we did, uh, about 20 k north of Adelaide. We increased our capacity by three times to about 35 million kilos per year of, of manufactured uh, wool. Um, increasing our weekly input need to 5,000 bales a week. The stockpile emerged in this same time, the late 80s, and we ended up trading about one third or nearly one million bales of that uh, into various parts of the world, a lot of it into Russia, a lot of it into China, uh, and that sort of uh, helped get rid of that big problem. Now, while this was happening, we also traded another 20 or 30 million kilos of uh, virgin wool to the rest of the world as well. So 35 million kilos of manufactured wool and another 30 million kilos of greasy wool. We were actually suddenly a major world leader in processing and trading wool. But on the horizon, China was looming. 
So the 2000 to now period, uh, the world of marketing and processing wool changed significantly, uh, particularly after the stockpile disappeared. Margins vanished, deal sizes were large, mainly driven by China because they were still in their large um, central buying inspired thought process. And we needed to keep a factory running at the same time and it had to be really good at the manufacturing process. So the game had definitely changed and uh, other markets began to shrink as China dominated. So combing in Australia was too expensive, so we closed that down in 2001. And the focus was now singularly on carbonising wool, which was, one, it was still a bit of a mystery to the Chinese, which was great because we could still do it, but we couldn't rely on that for long. A major change in company ownership in 2004 gave us now just two owners uh, the ability to make fast decisions. Um, so since 2004, these fast decisions are things like we purchased a carbonising competitor and moved the machinery to China. Uh, and built a new facility in China at the same time. We bought into a combing and spinning plant in Malaysia uh, and moved all our Australian combing machinery to Malaysia. Uh, that was uh, uh, then sold about three years later um, because we just got a deal we couldn't refuse. Uh, we solved one of several major environmental issues, which was water supply. We developed some new products with some new non-wool technology which we still use today, and we reduced our processing costs by 80%, which is the only reason that we're still here today. And I'll expand on a couple of these in a second. Before I do that, though, where do we sit in the industry? So this graph shows you the spread of volume versus uses by micron. Um, we're not your normal wool company. We don't focus very much on the men's suiting or the, 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 the fleece wool. Uh, we focus on knitting, felt and bedding markets in particular. Uh, our supply is the so-called bottom 10% of the clip, uh, as those red circles, not there. The, the, the woolen knits and the, the bedding market, sorry, there's a couple of bits missing on this slide. Um, the pieces, bellies, locks and crutchings and lambs are our major inputs. Our customers range from industrial spinners to high street fashion brands worldwide and we blend to a really tight specification, removing 99.85% of all the impurities in that first kilo of uh, greasy wool. We source our wool from far north Queensland through to Perth and everywhere in between. And uh, the market we find ourselves in uh, shows the benefits or otherwise of the wool more than any other process. So a bad input, then think of cost coarse wool stained or mixed breed fibres shows up in the form of peeling, uneven yarns, sweaters that hold easily or black and uncoloured fibres sticking on the outside of the garment. And these cause retailers, and therefore us, a significant heartburn. In the worsted fabric or the men's suiting fabrics, you can get away with a lot more because you can put it through more finishing processes to hide the faults. There we go. So that's, that's where we sit. So we, I moved to China. Um, in 05, a competitor stopped carbonising and we decided to buy his, uh, his machinery over a filing cabinet one afternoon. Why? We've been there since uh, 1948. We thought we knew the market. Uh, and more importantly, we could use wool from right around the world, whereas Australia, we can only use Australian wool. Um, and lastly, we'd be closer to our competition. There is nothing in there about going to China for cheaper production because it was a myth. So in 05, we built a building, 70 metres wide, 250 metres long, and moved 80 containers of machinery uh, and built an Australian-style factory. We began with no title to the land, no environmental licence and no business licence. It was pretty exciting. <laughs> so this is what we built. Uh, it's a smaller facility than Adelaide. Adelaide processes about 10 million kilos. This one is about 5 or 6 million. Uh, it's located one hour from Shanghai and we employed originally 180 people, uh, two, two expat uh, Aussies to manage it and uh, we also in installed our shrink proofing technology there as well. One of the things we did do smarter up there was address the environmental issues. Uh, we decided to build Western standards because we thought China were going to change the rules and lo and behold, 10 years later they did. That was a bit longer than we expected but uh, it caught up with everybody last year in 2015. Our investment has finally paid off because a big chunk of the industry was closed down because they couldn't comply with environmental uh, outflows. Um, 
We are now running the factory much more like Australia. Uh, we've uh, got one Aust Australian Chinese manager and we employ 90 Chinese rather than 180. So the cost down focus is alive and well. Back to Australia, um, the focus is similar. It's all about efficiency. In the last 10 years, our, produ our production costs have, have reduced by 80%. That's eight zero. Um, we're running one line, not two, for the same volume. Uh, we comply with environmental rules um, because we've invested a, a, an awful amount of money in, uh, in, in effluent treatment. But as, as the city continues to grow around us, we're going to have to come up with a smarter solution on that again. So um, we've come a long way, but we need more. Uh, the, our next focus is independence from, on energy and recycling our waste streams. One big success we had was back in 2002, about then, we, uh, we decided to invest in a water supply replacement program uh, and we fixed the cost for eight decades. We tend to think a bit long term in our, our business. Uh, we use 800 megalitres a year of water. Uh, up until 2003 it was all coming from the Murray River. It now comes entirely from a recharge aquifer right next door to us on the Parafield Airport. Um, since establishing this operation, uh, the water cost has risen by two to three dollars per kilolitre. Think of two to three million dollars extra cost per year, which we haven't had to pay. Um, and it would have jeopardised the business if we had to. So the solution caught the attention of an author, which is that book in the top right hand corner. Um, he thought it was groundbreaking and uh, fascinating and we just thought it was an interesting idea. So um, you get some of these, uh, these kicks occasionally that sort of work for no reason at all. Uh, simple and cost efficient, um, but very costly to build. So what's next? Environmental issues, new markets, new products and finding a regular supply are currently the main focuses. Uh, we do remain open for anything else that might come out and hit us from left field, but uh, we're looking at um, cogen plant for power and heat generation uh, using the uh, methane derived from our waste streams. Um, it's complex but has real potential and would get us ahead of the competition uh, in spades uh, who, are, who are, in particular China, who are facing rising power and gas and environmental costs, plus labour, plus rules, plus you name it, uh, it's all coming in China uh, with their growing population. Um, and as finally as drought continues to impact supply, uh, we have an appetite for 3,000 bales a week. Um, and are starting another business, or reinventing another business, uh, which is buying direct from the growers. Again, we did this back in the 80s, um, and providing, in this time, a brokering service. So this means we're going to go up against the major merchandising companies, which is going to be a lot of fun in itself. Uh, they should be selling to us happily, but they'd rather sell to somebody else, so we have to go and fight for our own market share. So what does it take to stay in the wool industry? Uh, patient capital, innovative thinking, and uh, just keep your eye on the risks. Uh, our current list of things to do and fix should keep us at the forefront of the industry for at least the next few years. Assuming we're successful with at least one of the ideas, um, who knows what will happen, but ultimately future generations will make the call on whether it's enough for now and whether they want to continue on. So thank you. <laughs>